So this morning I'm going to complete my analysis of three short stories with literary characters to exemplify the change in attitude and mindset that prepares a text that seems to be so radically innovative in terms of thinking and the judgment of somebody else's actions, such as The Prince of Machiavelli, a short book that he wrote starting from around 1512, 1513, when his administrator's career came to an abrupt end because Florence ceased to be a republic, the Medici family came back to town, and Machiavelli being connected to the previous government being suspected at one point of being part of a conspiracy against the Medicis was forced into retirement and confined by law, by decree, into his country estate where he had a villa that you can still visit today and where he had land that produced a little bit of income for him. And we'll read about that in a famous letter where he describes his typical day in the countryside and how he takes care of the business that he has there. After that, I'm going to review quickly the model that I extrapolated from the prince. And the next thing, either today or Friday, will be to take a short excerpt, excerpt from the first Machiavellian text we are going to read from, What Would Machiavelli Do by Stanley Bing from the year 2000, and apply that model to the analysis of a behavior of a strategy deployed by the characters in this episode, Bob and Mary, and assess whether, in fact, we really have a Machiavellian behavior, a Machiavellian strategy, whether a Machiavellian game is being played there or not. In the class website, you now find two videos. Finally, I had time last night to edit the videos I took with my iPad Pro. So you now find links to two YouTube videos those that <clears throat> show you Wednesday's class from last week and Friday's class from last week. You have to use those links because the videos are unlisted on YouTube, so they cannot be found unless you have a link. But if you have the link, you can freely uh, use those videos. And so if you either missed one of those classes or if at any point during the semester you want to review one of my lectures because you are preparing for the final exam, you review your notes, you find that the, the notes are lacking, that you're missing some of the details, or that the notes are not sufficiently clear, you can just refer to those videos and find the place where I'm talking about something in particular because that's much easier. Later on, I will edit Monday's class and I'll try to maintain a semblance of regularity in terms of posting those videos because we know the circumstances are, are still difficult for uh, a lot of people. There are still people who are uh, falling sick due to COVID and even though the uh, current Omicron variants, BA1, BA2, are not as powerful. Uh, they don't make you as sick as Delta. It might still mean that you uh, could be missing two, three, four classes, okay? So <clears throat> let's quickly review number one and number two, and then I will introduce the, the third story which is the longest of the three and also the most famous although number two Paolo and Francesca is pretty famous as well for example there are operas 
that are based on the story of Paolo and Francesca that were made between the 19th and the early 20th century. So if you remember in the first story, we found a, an aristocrat, a knight from the city of Rome who goes out, leaves the house to go to see a joust, a tournament, a typical medieval spectacle, entrusting the house and his son to the care of his wife, the lady of the house, and the maids. However, what is the lesson that one has to, is supposed that the reader from the time is supposed to learn from the story. The problem with the behavior of the knight is that the knight doesn't go by the natural laws. If he had better knowledge and followed the natural laws, he should have known that by nature women are, how are women according to the story? Sorry? Before that, what, what is that prompts everything? What is the first act? Why is the baby neglected by the maid? Um, because the woman or is allowing this the maid But why is no one in the room with the baby? Where are all the women in the story? Nigel. Yeah, but no, no, the, the question, you're, you're always so intellectual. The question is very specific. Where are all the women? Why is no one watching over the baby? Yes. Uh, they're on the terrace. Yes, why? Uh, to watch the joust. Right, to watch the joust from a distance because supposedly this is an aristocrat's palace and therefore it is in a downtown area and you can enjoy the view. So. This goes back to a typical medieval trope on which plenty of stories are based on, not just in Italian literature and culture, but also in the French literature and culture, the British, the English literature and culture. That is to say that women are curious. And because of their curiosity, they, they are curious to see what goes on in the joust, they neglect their duty and the entire hierarchy of the house, which would have required the lady of the house to tell the maid, stay with the baby, collapses, right? Because curiosity gets the best of these women. The knight doesn't follow the natural laws by entrusting the care of the baby and the house to the women during such an occurrence. The, the knight doesn't follow the natural laws because he ignores that women are also emotional. And so he follows their lead when he goes back to the house and they're all distraught over what they believe that it, it happened. That is to say that the dog killed the baby, the knight uh, the, and, and the lady of the house's son and therefore the knight kills the dog. The knight fails to follow the natural laws because instead of applying logic and rationality, instead of expressing the qualities that are supposed to be connected with proper leadership, he becomes gregarious to women that are not supposed to be leading, are not supposed to be at the top in any kind of situation. So what is the message? It can be expressed in any number of ways, but it usually takes the form of the knight should have, the knight could have, right? Because the issue is that in the end, the dog that saved the baby got killed instead of getting a reward. So you can say the knight should have done this, the knight could have done that, etc. When you examine the story from inside the context, inside the story itself or outside, the result is the same. That is to say, inside the story, 
the knight is a loser. The knight is someone who has not behaved properly, right? That failed to follow the proper rules of behavior. Outside of the story, same, right? Even if you judge this from outside, you still are supposed to, within the framework of this culture, to say, well, the knight made many mistakes. And those mistakes were driven, were motivated by his lack of leadership, his lack of familiarity with the nature of women versus the nature of men, etc. Okay? The second story is about Paolo and Francesca. Pa Francesca is married to, was married to Paolo's brother. It was an arranged marriage. Once she lives in the house, she gets to know Paolo, her brother-in-law, who's younger, sorry, who's younger, more handsome, who's uh, educated, for example, has a taste for fine literature. So because of their proximity, it's just natural that they fall in love. In love. And uh, they commit a carnal sin. They're caught by the husband in flagrante delicto, in the middle of their sexual crime. They're killed. They end up in hell because they didn't have time to repent, time to confess and be absolved of their sin. In this case, the problem is that Paolo and Francesca didn't go by God's laws, didn't follow the proper laws of religious ethics and morality that God gave to mankind through the Bible and that are being uh, reinforced and taught through the church. Even in this case, whatever commentary you make on the story, it ends up being the kind of should have, could have, right? They should not have spent time together without anyone else. They should not have been reading the kind of literature that stimulates romantic thinking. For example, the kind of literature such as Shivaric literature, the story of King Arthur, his wife, the Knights of the Round Table, where there are bad examples, where the wife of King Arthur can have a relationship or can be flirtatious with one of the knights, right? Stay away from bad literature, stay away from temptation, being alone. So this is what they could have done, read only in the presence of the husband or someone else, or a maid, spend less time together, read from the Bible, not read from a secular text full of sin and sinful temptation. Whether you examine the episode from the inside or the outside, in the frame of the culture of late medieval times and in the frame of the culture of the poet who wrote this episode, Dante Alighieri from Florence, 1265-1321, so last year it was 600 years from his death, the result is the same. And now this is interesting because we would not approach the story in the same way. That is to say, if we make a movie about this, then most of the movie is about the romantic relationship. It's about these two characters coming together, suspecting, intuiting that the other has some feelings, and now coming to the culmination of the revelation where they understand what they feel for each other, and then scenes of passionate sex, right? That's what the movie would be about. So in a modern version, they would be the heroes of the story, right? And the husband, would, the, the killer, would be the murderer, would be the villain. But the movie that we would produce, you and I, would be producing empathy in a natural way between the viewer and the lovers. The, the viewer would feel for the lovers, would think, well, this is natural. 
they're beautiful, they're young, they're attractive, they spend a lot of time together. How could they resist the temptation? And in fact, this kind of reaction is shared by the character of Dante, who is in hell, where these two souls, poor souls, are being punished. And Dante does feel for them. But if you remember, the conclusion of the episode before Dante goes on to visit other regions of hell, Inferno, the conclusion is that Dante faints. And that's a very unusual reaction. Uh, that's a unique reaction. And one way, of course, you find plenty, find hundreds of articles trying to explain this, but one quick and easy to understand way to explain the fainting is that there is a contrast that cannot be resolved in Dante's mind. On one side, he's a poet. And as a younger poet, before he wrote the Divine Comedy, he used to write about love a lot. In particular, love for a woman whose name was Beatrice, and who was married herself. Even though Dante was very respectful and loved Beatrice from a distance. So no sex involved in this case. No help for Dante. And Dante feels for Francesca. Dante understands the plight of these two young lovers. At the same time, on the other side of his mind, of his brain, and, and, and the split causes him to faint, he knows he goes to church. He reads the Bible. He reads religious texts. And as someone from the Middle Ages who's deeply religious, immersed in a religious society, Dante knows that no matter what you feel about these two, they deserved to go to hell. And there are no exceptions to God's laws. So at best, Dante can faint, right? Because those two... <sighs> impulses, uh, those two uh, wishes are too big of a conflict. The wish to excuse Francesca, empathize with them, and the wish to respect God and show respect and love for God's rules. Okay, So in this kind of setting of the late Middle Ages, it's not like Inside the story, you have two people having fun, right? And having a good time until they're killed. And then from the outside, you can sit in judgment and say, Oh, you who sinned carnally, go to hell. There is no split. Because whether from the inside or the outside, the result is supposed to be the same. And the result is... And, and the idea, the judgment that you're supposed to render on this is that carnal pleasure between two people who are not married is not real pleasure. So in one way or the other, you resolve the conflict. Whether you examine this just from inside the context of the story or from the outside, the result is supposed to be the same. They are sinners. And if they are sinners, then even when you look at them inside their own context, that pleasure is not real pleasure. It's not something deep. It's not some, something authentic, something true. They were not true to themselves because being one with God is your, supposed to be your true, authentic nature. Okay? So be careful, because our temptation, we do that all the time. The media do that all the time. So it's a habit for us is simply to say, oh, I love that. I, I love Paolo and Francesca, right? And we have plenty of passionate love stories that involve an extramarital affairs <clears throat> in our movies, in our media. And we, we're used to it, right? And a married couple can enjoy a series or a movie where there is that kind of situation. It doesn't mean that they'll be unfaithful to each other because they like the story. It's just that you say, okay, well, from one point of view, 
I, I can empathize with them, right? It doesn't mean that I don't believe in marriage or that I believe that anyone should have sex with whomever they want. We're able to split our minds. We are all about contrasts. And we're not trying to come to a reconciliation of different views the same way Dante does. And it becomes an impossibility. He faints because it's impossible to reconcile those two. For us, it's normal, right? The same way that we watch a movie where the character is a villain and we like it. We, we make him the hero, right? Which doesn't mean that we condone crime in real life. We're just able to, to split. We, we don't find the need to reconcile everything and bring anything, everything under one system of ideas, which is the foundation of medieval culture, to have God as the unifying factor of everything, whether it be literature, real life, entertainment, music, anything. Anything should be falling under the laws of God. Let's examine the third story. And let's see how different it is from the other two. The context of the third story is, once again, as in the case of The Knight and the Dog, a collection of novellas, a collection of short stories, with a story, including all of them, and that frame story, or cornice, is the following. The book starts in <coughs> Florence, in 1348. In Florence, as in other parts of Italy and Europe, there is an epidemic called the Black Plague, which will last in Florence for about a year and a half, will end only midway through 1849. And the results in Florence, which are pretty similar to other places in Italy and Europe, the results because we have enough documents left from that period for a city such as Florence, the result is that between 40 and 60% of the population dies. The plague kills about half of the population, maybe even more than half. It, it's a very dramatic event, and it's an event that you find documented in works of literature, in historical documents, in private journals, it changes the city of Florence completely. After the epidemic, after the city has been virtually destroyed, the population has been halved, they are forced to call in people from the countryside, right? Because the urban activities cannot be sustained anymore without a workforce. So one of the radical uh, immediate changes, transformation caused by the bubonic plague in Florence is that a lot of people abandon their agricultural activities and become workers in manufacturing activities in the city. So the identity, the social and the cultural identity of the city changes radically within just a few years. In the frame story, uh, the plague is everywhere. There are dead bodies in the streets. People are losing all their family members. One by one, members of each family are getting sick. Some survive, but they are very few. And it's a very chaotic situation. There are no laws, there are no rules. Even within the family, right? You are afraid of each other. You're afraid of contagion. You don't understand what is going on. At the beginning of this frame story, <clears throat> seven young women. Let me get some water. <clears throat> seven young women from Florence, all from upper class families, and three young men, all from upper class families, found each other in a church that you can still visit in Florence, Santa Maria Novella, beautiful church near the train station. And 
they talk, they, they know each other, they're friends. And they talk and they say, <clears throat> what are we going to do? We are alone. We've lost our families. And the city is in a very chaotic situation. We might die. Certainly we will suffer psychologically because of the spectacle of death around us. And we might, might fall sick. So why don't we, together, leave the town, leave the city, walk out of Florence, and reach a villa, which belongs to one of them, just a few miles outside of Florence, and spend some time together over there. They don't do that to escape the pandemic, to escape the epidemic. They know that the plague is killing people in the countryside as well. They're doing it to find a psychological refuge from the plague. In particular, because during the two weeks they will spend together in this villa, they will spend the warmest hours, the, the hottest hours of, of the afternoon, and Florence is one of the hottest cities in Italy because of the nature of the territory, because of the location to this day. Uh, they say, well, during the siesta hours, to relax, we'll gather around in a circle, and everyone will tell a story. Everyone will tell the others a story or a novella. And they do that five days a week, because one day is for uh, washing, getting clean, washing their clothes. One day is for God, of course, religious practices. They do that five days a week for two weeks, 10 people, and you have 100 novellas. This is the first one. And of course, this collection of novellas is like a secular Bible. Because it's like someone who went through those events, Boccaccio, who began writing the collection of stories in 1350, right after the end of the plague, is someone saying, we need to rethink our system of values. We need to reimagine what the world would be for us, the survivors. And the kind of world he imagined is very much a, a humanist utopia, where the heroes are secular heroes that don't go necessarily by the laws of God. They still go by the laws of nature. So, for example, you might know about the Decameron or about the name of Boccaccio because of the many erotic novellas included there. And a typical situation you find in those erotic novellas is the following. There is a young woman married to an old guy. Of course, it is an arranged marriage. The family gave their beautiful young daughter to a rich and powerful old man. And this contradicts natural laws because they'll have different amounts of libido, of sexual desire, because how can they be attracted to each other and be compatible with each other? So the wife finds a younger lover, and they have plenty of sex and plenty of pleasant good times, but they're not condemned according to the, the laws of God. There is the assumption that they've done something wrong, However, their wrong behavior, the kind of sexual behavior they engage to outside of the marriage, is the result of a bigger wrong. The bigger fault is the fault of society. So they are not fully responsible or to be blamed for engaging with sex with someone who is the same age, has the same kind of strong libido, who is as attractive as they are, because it is society that did wrong by them by allowing such a young, beautiful woman to be married to an old geezer, right? So that's the, that's the issue. So forget about their salvation, their uh, eternity in hell. It's society that should change their ways and not place someone young in that kind of situation, which is already interesting as an approach. 
So you, you have the first novella, and being the first has to be significant, the first and the last, right? It's like Genesis chapter one, right? It is foundational. And what is the choice of the story for this first novella? It's the most unusual, the most odd choice of a story. And it is something that is not to be expected right towards the end of the Middle Ages, but we are, in fact, transitioning from medieval culture towards the culture of the humanity. This is the story of a man from Prato, known as Ciappelletto. Now, keep in mind that Prato is a town in between my hometown, Pistoia, in northern Tuscany, and Florence. There are about 20 miles between my hometown, Pistoia, and Florence. In between, 10 miles from each other town, there is Prato. And in the medieval culture, every town, every community is like a different species, a different race. And there is a strong rivalry and competition. And to this day, you find proverbs saying the most awful things about people from the next town. And it could be literally someone who's two miles, five miles, 10 miles away, okay? The best example would be the following proverb. Meglio un morto in casa che un pisano all'uscio. It is better to have a death in the family than someone from Pisa at the door. And what is being blamed on the people of Pisa? That they're so depressing, that they're more depressing than having someone die in your, in your family. Okay? It's terrible. In other proverbs, uh, the people from the next town are all thieves, or they're all liars, etc. So it is significant that this man, who, if you read the, when you read the novel, you will see is the most terrible man who ever lived, comes not from Florence, but from the next city. Because we all know how people from Prato are. To this day, in my hometown or in Florence, they will say all the worst things about people from Prato. So Ciappelletto is a notary who ends up in the city of Paris. A lot of Italian merchants and professionals went to work in France. France and Italy had a commercial partnership that was revived throughout the Middle Ages. If you think of what is one of the most famous medieval saints in Italy, can you think of a man who became a saint and whose name is popular all over the world? Who was from Assisi? Francesco. Francesco. Francesco is not, was not before that time a common name. Why was he called Francesco? Because the base word for Francesco is France. His, house, his father was one of those merchants who routinely went to France to do business. And to show that this commercial activity in France was the foundation of his family, decided to call his son Francesco, right? a name that is reminiscent of the word Francia, France, okay? So it's normal for the time. Ciappelletto is born in Prato, ends up in Paris, where he works as a notary, helping um, merchants draw a contract or other documents, assisted them in legal matters, right? However, Ciappelletto, as I said, is being described in the novella as the worst man who ever lived. In fact, you could define him quickly by saying that he's like the Antichrist, that's how bad he is. Or better yet, if you examine the details, he's the perfect opposite of San Francis of Assisi. He's the perfect opposite of a saint. Why the perfect opposite? Because not only he is violent, he is a liar. He drinks and eats too much. He's associated in all sorts of criminal activities, forgeries, etc. But he does that not just for his own profit. He does that out of pleasure. He does that even for free, which is the foundation of the extraordinary virtue of a saint. In order to become a saint, you need to prove in the Vatican committees 
that this person uh, had virtues that were extraordinary. And one of the foundations for this quality of extraordinary virtues is that you did something even if you didn't have to, and even if you didn't gain anything from it. So you could have avoided it completely, okay? So it's not like um, I'm, I'm driving a car and I, and I see an accident and I stop and I help someone. That's natural, that's a natural virtue. It's a virtue because I could have driven off uh, and ignored the, the, the plea of someone by the side of the road. But there is nothing extraordinary there. Extraordinary would be to walk to a place where you know there was an accident, but you're miles away, okay? And you don't have a car, but you, you put such a big effort, right? Because you want to help someone. So, Ciappelletto is a terrible man. Never goes to church, does all these terrible things. And one of his protectors, one of his patrons, is a powerful Italian merchant by the name of Musciatto, Francesi. Musciatto uh, is like the dawn of the situation. He benefits from the uh, criminal support given by Ciappelletto, and Musciatto is influential enough to shield Ciappelletto from the consequences, right? Because no one would retaliate against Ciappelletto when he does something wrong because he is being protected by this man, Musciato, who's rich and powerful, meaning he's connected. In fact, he's so connected that they give him a, an administrative position, an ambassadorship, and therefore a kind of ambassadorship. And therefore, Musciato leaves Paris. Now, Ciappelletto is without someone to protect him someone to shield him from the consequences of his bad deals, multiple bad deals. And so his situation is kind of precarious. However, Musciato, before leaving town, approaches Ciappelletto and they play this kind of theater with each other. They know what is going to happen. They know what is the deal, what is the situation. Without Musciato, Ciappelletto could be at the very least beaten up or jailed or killed. And Ciappelletto knows that also. So Musciato has a proposition. He says, listen guys, I have money that I need to recover. I gave out loans to people from another French town and, I, and, and they haven't paid me back. And we know that these people, because as I said, the medieval assumption is that every community, every town has a different racial profile, a different kind of attitude or mindset. These people are not easy, they're kind of crafty. It's not like you go there and you say, oh, give me my money back, and they will. No, they'll find excuses, they'll, they'll create problems. So Musciato says, you, Ciappelletto, you are the right kind of men for this job. You go there, you recover my money, right? This way, you skip down, and you make some money, and you do me a favor, right? Because you recover this money, which could very well be lost to me because these people are so difficult. And keep in mind, we're talking about Italian merchants in France giving out money to French people. It's not like you can invoke the French laws so easily in the Middle Ages. You're a foreigner. You don't have the same rights as people born there. So it's easier for the French who owe this money to Musciato to avoid paying, right? Because uh, it's a delicate situation. Of course, Ciappelletto has no alternative. However, he plays this kind of theater and says, oh, I'll be glad to. And he goes. He goes to this French town and his approach is to play coy. He presents himself as a meek, mild-mannered old man so that the French who owe money to Musciato will not fear him. They will think, oh, it'll be easy for us to avoid pain. 
Meanwhile, he's studying them, observing them, and elaborating the correct approach to getting this money back. So they're not doing any preparations, but because they think he's stupid, silly old man, but he's, he's already thinking of a plan, okay? And so during this stay in this French town, Ciappelletto falls sick, which is natural. Of course, he's been drinking and, and eating too much all his life. <laughs> what can you expect, right? He's sick, he's about to die. And during the stay, he lived as a guest in the house of two other Italian merchants who owed a favor to Mushat. So to exchange, to, to repay Mushato for, for his help, they accepted Ciappelletto in their house. And when Ciappelletto falls sick, they have a dilemma. And they talk about this right outside the bedroom, the room where Ciappelletto is sick. They say, what are we going to do? Because they know that Ciappelletto was such a terrible man. So they say, now, he's about to die. So our dilemma is either we call a priest for the last blessing and the confession. Before dying, you're supposed to confess all of your sins. Because otherwise, if you don't confess, you'll go to hell for sure. But if we call a priest and he makes a confession, then directly or indirectly, everyone know, will know what kind of people these Italians are. Our reputation will be tarnished, will suffer, right? Because we are foreigners, and then we have a French priest confess, confessing, hearing the confession of this man who was like the Antichrist. And even though the priest will not, cannot reveal the confession, the priest will go to the pulpit and say, beware of these Italians. They are dogs. They are devils. Right? Okay. This is one alternative. What is the other alternative in this dilemma? We don't call a priest. But we don't call a priest, he dies like a dog. And the people around in the community will say, what kind of people are these Italians? They had one of their own dying, and they didn't call a priest sending this poor guy to hell. So either way, our reputation will suffer. And with our reputation, you cannot conduct good business. Reputation is the foundation of business, right? Of, of commercial business, of commercial transactions. OK. so. Chapelletto hears everything and he says, come in, I'll take care of it. Don't worry, I'll, I'll resolve this conundrum. You just call in the holiest priest you can find in town and I'll take care of it. And of course the two brothers, they have no alternative, they say, okay, let's try it. They send out message to a priest, the priest comes in, and most of the novella is the farcical, surreal confession of Ciappelletto. Because Ciappelletto will calm the priest into believing that he was not such a bad man. In fact, at the end, right after the confession, Ciappelletto dies, the priest organizes a funeral, and during the funeral, the priest in church to the French community says, you people, you are the worst. Look at this foreigner. He lived such a saint life, such a pure, he had such pure thoughts. And you, you curse God every day, you don't pray, you ignore God's laws, and he is so convincing that the town decides to keep Ciappelletto's body and call him a saint, take shreds of his clothes, of his funeral, funerary uh, garbs, right? To keep them as relics, as something that has magical powers. How is that Ciappelletto can achieve this incredible result? He is a con artist by definition. What is the definition of a con artist? 
vis-a-vis -vis a thief. A classical definition is the following. A thief is someone who takes your money, right? A con artist is someone who gives you his money. And in fact, that's the foundation of many cons, right? Situation, like the typical. Have you ever received a classical email from a Nigerian prince uh, or uh, from some other areas of the world saying, I have this money, but I, I, I cannot get it out of the bank. It, it is mine by uh, inheritance, but uh, there are issues. So help me cash in this money, and I'll give you a chunk of that money. Or in other cons, someone approaches you and they say, listen, I, I need to go to the restroom. Can you hold on to this bag? But be careful because there, there is mud inside or, or there is a, an expensive computer inside. So they gain your trust to prepare the ground for switching and taking your money. But first, that's why a con, con comes from which English word? It's the first syllable of a con trick. Con is the first syllable of the word? Contrary. Nope. Can I? No. Nope. Confidence. Mm. Confidence. They need your trust in order for the trick to succeed. Okay? And what is the con? Instead of telling the priest, of course, he, he lies, right? He doesn't say I was a terrible individual. I, I killed, I beat other people, I, I committed all kinds of sins, etc. No, he says to the priest, Oh, Father, I was the most terrible man who ever lived. And the priest says, Okay, I'm here for this reason. Tell me what sins have you committed. But every time he says I did something terrible, the story, either by the, through the details or from the context, contradicts the assumption, and therefore it is the priest who has to say, no, this is not so terrible. So, for example, he will say, I cannot be forgiven. Chapeletto will say, there is no way you, Father, can forgive me. I'm going to hell. Why? Because I cursed at my mother. And the priest says, okay, that's bad, but that, it, it, it's not so bad that you would spend the third in hell. At which point, Chapeletto says, Father, what are you saying? My mother carried me in her womb for nine months and she uh, took care of me as an infant, uh, etc., etc. Et or he will say, I, I did something terrible that cannot be excused. What is it? Once I was in the church and I spit. Now, churches in the Middle Ages were social places. People didn't go to the church to pray or for the mass. They also went there just to socialize. And people during the Middle Ages and later on, in Italy, spit on the ground. And they would do that in church as they were doing it in the streets. So much that even St. Francis of Assisi mentions that habit in a letter. He's writing to his friars and saying, please, don't, don't spit on, on, on the floor inside the church, right? It is the temple of God, after all. So he says, I spit in the church. The priest then says, well, listen, we all do it. Even the priests do it. And Chapeletto says, how can you do something like that? How can you tolerate something like that? It is the temple of God. It is the most, the holiest place there is on earth, etc. So he's not trying to convince the, the priest that he is a good man. He's trying to convince the priest that he's a sinner. And it's the priest who plays the opposite role by definition. So, for example, to give you one last example, Chapeletto will say, I sinned because I, I was taken by anger. And, and the priest says, who, who were you angry at? And he says, well, I saw people who were cheating, merchants who were uh, not giving the, the proper amount of money to, to others, and I got angry at them. So, <laughs> it's, it's not, once you hear the story, justifiable anger at other people's sinful behavior. So how does it work and what happens in comparison to everything else? In the case of the knight, 
he should have followed the natural laws, right? In the case of Paolo and Francesca, they should have followed God's laws. In the case of Ciappelletto, what did Ciappelletto do? He followed the rules of the game. That is to say, he had a goal in mind to protect the business of his boss and of other Italian merchants. And he did what he had to. Within the constraints of that situation, given the limited time that he had, he was about to die. Given the context, he was there confined to this bedroom, right? Doesn't have the strength to go out. He's alone. This is the only solution, okay? Now, what happens with the inside and outside of the context kind of assessment? Inside the story, inside the context, he is our hero. He wins the day. He manages to convince a holy priest, and the text says, well-versed in the scriptures, so not a naive priest, but someone who knows the Bible, who's an honest man. He manages to convince this priest that he, who's like the Antichrist, what should, should become a saint people pray to. So, he's the right man for this kind of job, right? He protects the business at all costs. He saves the day for other people. So, inside the context of the con, he has extraordinary, he displays, demonstrates extraordinary abilities, right? And using what? Not force, but influence, right? When, when you talk someone into doing something that's influenced according to Machiavellian principles. From the outside, he's not necessarily the hero. From the outside, you can also say he's a terrible man. Because this victory doesn't excuse him from a life of crime. This victory doesn't excuse him from going to hell, if you believe hell exists, right? However, compared to these other stories, now for the first time, you find something that will become habitual for us and our culture to split the assessment. From one point of view, from inside the story, he's a hero, right? You can make a movie about him. From the outside, when you leave the theater, you would never condone such a behavior, whether you're religious or not, okay? And so for the first time, you have a situation where instead of going by universal laws, the laws of nature, the laws of God, you go by the rules of the game. What could be done to win that game in that context, because each game has a context? Well, he did win the game by coming up with a very creative solution. And we need to admire his intelligence for designing this con, which he might have played to the expense of his own eternal damnation. Because Boccaccio, who wrote the story, does not imply that there is no God, there is no hell. And neither does Machiavelli. Machiavelli probably was not religious. However, we have anecdotal evidence that he believed that there might be heaven and hell. And therefore, the evil leader of the prince is someone who might go to hell even though inside the context they win the game. And Machiavelli is different in not trying to reconcile the inside and the outside. Reconciling would mean you leaders be honest otherwise you go to hell. And Machiavelli is saying no. You leaders do whatever you have to even though it might cost you an eternity in hell. And there is even the story of a dream Machiavelli had that, uh, whether true or not, uh, gives you an understanding of that, whether true or not, because the dream was apparently told by Machiavelli to one of his friends uh, a couple of months before he died, when he was sick, and we don't know whether it is invented or true.